we record uh, the orchestra in descending order. We do uh, the, the pieces of music that require the most people f first and then dismiss who we don't need. So we have a quieter room. That, that's pretty much it. And it goes very quickly because I'm so fortunate to have the A-call musicians who, who like to play my dates every week. They're so good, they just sight read everything. And more than sight read everything, they're so adept here in Los Angeles to doing so many different kinds of music. You hardly have to even explain what the musical intent is. They can just look at it and they know it's jazz. They know it's more classical or it's, uh, they just get it. Hey cats, welcome to another edition of In The Musician's Studio. Today we have the incredible, the one and only Dave Lowe, Director of Jazz Studies at UNLV, Jazz and Commercial Music Studies at UNLV. Thank you, Julian, Chris, and Nathan. Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Lowe, can you please um, give the students a taste of your background? All right, so good to see everyone. Uh, hope you're having a great experience. It's a little different this semester, but I'm sure everybody is uh, embracing uh, all the musical programs and the, uh, the computer programs technology in order to keep growing as, as musicians. Uh, I started playing the piano around seven years old. I was in uh, Norristown, Pennsylvania. It's a suburb of Philadelphia, about 20 miles outside of Philadelphia. And uh, kind of a lower middle class family. I was the oldest of five. My father was a machinist, uh, and uh, my mother stayed home on the five of us. And so, for somebody, um, well, actually, what happened? Um, I also had an uncle who played in a volunteer fireman band on the weekends, and he played drums. Uh, and I, he wanted me. I, I would visit him sometimes on the weekends. His wife, my aunt, and him. And uh, he would want me to work out in the garden. And he said, where are you? You know, and I'd, I'd be inside. I found his drumsticks. And I guess I was trying to play what I had heard on the phone book or something. And so he said, hey, this guy, this 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 kid's got some something going on. And then in school, um, I remember watching Young People's Audience or something under Lord Bernstein. And then they gave us a test, seashore test. Or so. I guess it was a standardized test, test, which was like an ear training. And I don't, I don't, I vaguely remember it, but I remember that they said you got, I got everything right on it, whatever, that I should have music lessons. So then um, we got connected with the organist at the church uh, that we attended. It was a Lutheran church in uh, Norristown, Pennsylvania. And so my teacher was Dr. Duddy. Dr. Duddy really wanted me to um, have a career as a Lutheran organist choir director. That's really what he was pushing me towards. Um, I would go around the corner with my African-American friends and they'd want me to figure, they realized, you know, I could hear a song and I could go kind of figure it out, you know, by ear. And they were playing songs from the Temptations and different R&B Motown groups. <clears throat> and uh, I would, the other one was on the TV, I think there was a, the theme from Mannix. His name's Mannix, Joe Mannix. <laughs> Which was a great TV theme. And also that, 40 years later, I got to play it at the Hollywood Bowl with Lalo Schifrin right there. But when I was about nine, I figured this out by ear and I went and I was excited and I tried to play it for Dr. Duddy, you know, after playing a little Bach piece. And he slammed the lid on my fingers. I mean, it, it, he, he scared me. He didn't, you know, literally do it, but he scared me. He said, Mr. Loeb, you know, that's not appropriate for you to play. And so I realized that early on I was going to have to separate my classical training with you know, what I did outside of there. Now, my whole life seems to have been um, one of my main missions is to try to bring all this music together. And I say myself, everyone is doing that. But because I realized that that wasn't correct, it was his, my teacher's kind of view of the musical world, but it wasn't the real musical world. So I would do those kind of uh, activities on my own. And then I would play the Bach for him. I would uh, learn to play pipe organ, which was a blessing because later I did that at the Hollywood Bowl. So I went to one of the top schools in the Philadelphia area, which turned out to be really strong in music education. So I did a music education degree. However, the entire time I was going to that school, I was playing professionally. In fact, I started my first professional gig was playing in church 
And when I was 15, I was organist choir director in a Lutheran church. Um, I would run out of music to play or time to practice it. So I would just start improvising during the communion on whatever, uh, leave it on a jet plane. And I'd try to play it in the kind of a fugato way. So I was trying to improvise from an early age, but it was classical improvisation as much as jazz. And then I went to Westchester. I, I played in their big band there, the Criterions, which has another long history all the way back to Bob Kernow, who had played in that band. So I played in uh, at Westchester, but the entire time I was in school, I was working professionally outside. I started uh, freelancing with different um, kind of gigs, and then I ended up getting hired at a place that Mickey Rooney, who was a famous actor, owned called the Downingtown Inn. And we would play five nights a week. And there was a little piano, um, piano Ola, I think it's called, in the bar. And during the week, we would play like nobody was really listening. So we would play Herbie Hancock tunes and those kind of things. Then on the weekends, I would play for shows. And uh, some of the people that came in, there was a guy named Soupy Sales, who was a comedian. There was a um, a mind reader a guy named uh, Kreskin who would come in and he would want music behind him. And there were singers. I remember Anna Marie Abergetti. And so these singers would come in and I got to play for them with, a, a, we had a core trio. And then there were horn players that would come up from Philadelphia, from the Philadelphia Academy, you know. And, and I got to be friends with them. And they, word got tossed around Philadelphia, you know, and they would include me with their group. So we had a, what we called a kicks band, like a big band that would meet on Sundays over in New Jersey. Well, the lead trumpet player was Earl Garner, who's a lead trumpet player on Saturday Night Live now. A uh, good friend of mine named Bobby Malik. Um, I mean, the whole band was like that. So I had never played with musicians. I, I played with a lot of good musicians early, but this was just a phenomenal group. And the drummer in that group, Mark DiCiani, <clears throat> later on um, <clears throat> hired me to go on the road with Ben Vereen. But that was after I had gone on the road with, uh, I was a house piano player at a place called the Valley Forge Music Fair. And we would play for shows like the God's, Godspell. So then I played in the Valley Forge Music Fair. I was on the road with the Glenn Miller Band, went on the road with the Miller Band. And we stop in Rochester, New York. <clears throat> and uh, it's a typical blizzard in Rochester, you know, two feet of snow, no big deal, right? Every night. <clears throat> and uh, my first wife actually was on the road with us on the bus. And... So I picked up a Downbeat magazine. <clears throat> True story. It's one of the reasons why I still like, I love Downbeat magazine. <clears throat> I open it up and there's an ad. I think it was a full page ad uh, <clears throat> offering master of music and jazz and commercial music, Eastman School of Music, right? So I look at the ad <clears throat> and I realize, wait a minute, I'm in Rochester. Found out the school was two blocks away. <clears throat> Walk into the Eastman Theater, which I could not believe it. I, the, the orchestra was playing the Rite of Spring the student orchestra and in all honesty, not a slant to any professional orchestras, but it was as good as most symphonies you'd hear anywhere. These are students. And I was just in, in shock. I mean, in awe hearing this walking into this majestic theater. And I see my friend Malcolm from high school playing timpani. <clears throat> he was subbing that day for another somebody that became one of my good friends, a uh, brilliant musician by the name of John Seri from Eastman, but percussionist, jazz pianist, uh, was nominated for a Grammy for one of his pieces, but that's another story. So anyway, I snuck around, I came, I found my way to the back of the auditorium or the back of the stage and Malcolm, my friend, you know, put his timpani mallets down and he's coming out and I said, Malcolm, and he, and he said, Dave, what are you, what are you doing here? <clears throat> I said, Malcolm, I don't have much time. And I opened up the downbeat. I said, I want to know about this. You know, we had this way of get like right to it, you know, getting right to the, because I said, I, don't, I have three hours and then the bus is leaving. <clears throat> I want to find out about this. <clears throat> so he takes me right across the annex. Julian knows where that is, right? Right across <clears throat> up to whatever floor it was, fifth, sixth floor, you know, snow everywhere. <clears throat> And he knocks on Rayburn Wright's door. Rayburn Wright was the director of the program at that time. Uh, there's a whole, you could do a whole story on Rayburn, who was the, uh, the chief writer arranger for Radio City Music Hall. But not everybody knows he was also uh, uh, what we say is a ghost orchestrator for Henry Mancini. <clears throat> Just a brilliant and 
one of Maria Schneider's biggest influences when she was there. So uh, my friend knocks on Rayburn Wright's door. He's like, come on in, you know, uh, what do you want? I said, I I'm interested in applying. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what's your background? You know what? And he says, wait a minute. So he goes down the hall, knocks on Bill Dobbins door. <laughs> now, the irony of this is Bill Dobbins was as Julian's Tanaka's mentor at Eastman, literally 39, 40 years later. So at any rate, so I, I walk in, I'm sitting in Ray's room. He had an upright piano. Julian, I don't know if he, that was still there when you were there. I guess Ray had passed away, but upright piano. <clears throat> and uh, I said, how are your grades? Hey, you're pretty good. What's your degree? <clears throat> okay, play, play something for us, right? So I think I played Stella by Starlight. Bill Dobbins had come in. I played a couple of choruses, you know, solo piano. <clears throat> and then they say, okay, we're highly interested in you. Uh, in fact, we might, we were interested in maybe you having an assistantship. <clears throat> so, but they said, you have to go take a classical audition first. <clears throat> I said, well, I'm not really prepared for that. And the bus is leaving in an hour now, an hour and a half. <clears throat> Um, so I, I had to go downstairs and I had to talk, I had to go to the other building and talk to, uh, I'm trying to think his name, He's the head of the department. Uh, uh, I'll think of it. <clears throat> I'll think of it. Anyway, rate, so I go into this gentleman's office who's in charge of the piano department <clears throat> and he says, well, you know, you're going to have to come back and audition for us for a classical piano audition because at that time to do a jazz degree, you also had to do classical. I said, I'm, I'm, the bus is leaving and, and we're going on road. Then I go to Puerto Rico and Hawaii for, you know, for the next six months and I, I pay my own bills. I'm sorry. I don't know how I would get back here. And they said, well, we'll have to make an appeal to the committee. I said, can you send in any recordings? And, and luckily I had played the Ravel G major concerto at Westchester with the orchestra as an honor soloist. Yeah, of course. Everybody has a recording of the G major. <laughs> I, I still have it in my, in here somewhere in a reel to reel. So somehow I made a copy of it. I don't know. I sent it in and then some Chopin that I had played. And then I get a letter saying, OK, you're accepted. And also they offered me the assist first. Ass I, I think I had the first assistantship in the jazz studies program, maybe with Bob Shepard. I think the two of us had the assistantships. <laughs> a great sax player.